All right, everyone, good evening. Today is Sunday, November 8th, and let's walk through an introduction to finance recruiting. Personally, I've been fortunate to garner experience going through the interview process for both sales and trading and investment banking roles. During my sophomore summer in sales and trading, I'm being scheduled to do my junior summer in investment banking. Um, I'd love to give you an introduction to the field and the questions that are particularly pertinent in the recruiting process. So uh, with that done in mind, let's begin. Kicking things off, let's talk about what an investment bank is and the breakdowns that that entails. On the left-hand side of your screen, see something called investment banking advisory. This is a role that is typically described as being investment banking. This is where you are advising corporates on making long-term strategic decisions, whether that's affecting their capital structure, doing a debt restructuring, working on M&A, you are doing something for a corporate client. In sales and trading, the idea is that you are working in the markets division of the bank. You are working to um, essentially provide liquidity in specific products. The idea is that you collect a spread by providing the service of making these products liquid, which means that when someone comes to market and wants to buy this security or sell a security, you are able for a price to take the other side of this transaction. So within investment banking, you have coverage industry groups, which are where you are specifically focused in, not surprisingly, a single industry. So this is where terms like being an industrials banker, or being a PNU banker, or being a healthcare banker come into play because you focus on a specific industry. Your client base is concentrated in a specific area, which means that you develop industry specific expertise. In product groups, also within investment banking, you focus on doing a specific type of deal or doing a specific type of fundraising. What this means is that you could be an M&A banker where all you do is advise on mergers and acquisitions and divestitures, which means irrespective of industry, you are doing advisory work there. And depending on the bank and group in particular, sometimes coverage groups will do most of the modeling. Sometimes product groups will lean towards doing just execution, which means just bringing the transaction to market. However, this does vary by bank and role. You also have a concept called debt restructuring, which is where a company that either is in bankruptcy or is nearing bankruptcy wants to restructure its capital structure. What this means is basically there are debts that it can't pay or it looks like it will not be able to pay and it wants to exchange those for something new. All right. So within sales and trading, we have a couple different divisions. Obviously you have sales and trading and you also have something called structuring. Structuring is in no way related to the investment banking counterpart restructuring. Restructuring has to do with its debt. And structuring is the idea of creating typically some sort of esoteric product or some, some sort of bespoke product in response to a specific client need. So for example, you could have a macro structuring or an FX structuring desk where a corporate client like Apple would come in and say, hey, we're an American company that reports earnings in US dollars. However, um, we might get revenues from all over the world and have a lot of expenses that we have to pay in RMB out in China. So with that in mind, you need to have some sort of FX hedge if you don't want to be exposed to FX risk. Um, there's a whole nother conversation that we can have of whether or not companies should and if the degree to which they do FX hedge is appropriate. But one of the things that structuring can do is to create a specific contractual agreement that allows these two counterparties, the bank and the firm, to essentially create some sort of specific contract that is structured accordingly. You can also have structuring where you are, say, creating a mortgage-backed security or creating an asset-backed security which basically means you are retranching cash flows to be able to sell them to a different universe of investors with different risk profiles and risk appetites. Sales and trading um, are pretty much what they sound like. Trading is 
actually buying and selling the securities, usually in S&T, they're going to be QSIP securities, which is an SEC registrant thing. And when you're in the trading seat, you're likely to also be doing the hedging. Um, what this means is say, for a bond, when you buy a bond, you're gonna be long duration, unless it's like an IO or something weird, but think of a simple corporate bond or even, even easier. Let's think of a simple treasury bond. If you are buying a treasury bond, say you are buying the 10 year treasury, you'll have a duration that's somewhere around eight and a half. And if you wanna go into more detail on the world of fixed income, I do have a lecture video that walks through an introduction to um, fixed income. And um, the idea is you are sitting duration long when you buy a bond. This means that you have risk exposure that you might not want to have. So to hedge out that risk exposure, you could sell a different bond against it. This is something that a trader would do to keep their book hedged, to limit the risk exposure that they have, to make it exclusive to a specific area. On the sales side of the business, that is the job of garnering more client support, getting more clients to decide to choose your liquidity maker to um, trade with. So this means that when they wanna go to market, instead of just choosing someone in particular, they're going to go to the person that they have a relationship with. And they will have a relationship with someone in the sales and trading division of the investment bank. And that can inspire them to decide to trade with you. Some of the words you'll see on the bottom are also things that you'll hear. All of these roles comprise the front office of an investment bank. So you also have divisions like the corporate bank or the commercial bank, which relate to the idea of doing more typical fundraising. So an investment banking advisor will work with typically the CEO and CFO of the company and their respective teams. However, in the corporate bank and commercial bank, you're gonna work more with the treasury. It's going to be doing normal capital raises. It's going to be doing typical term, ro term loans. For lack of a better term, um, term, I would say that it is a bit less exciting. The transactions you're doing are a bit less bespoke and more standardized. As you move towards um, that second box, you see something called capital markets. This is something very closely related to investment banking advisory and is something that also relates to ECM, DCM, and Levfin. ECM stands for equity capital markets. DCM stands for debt capital markets. And Levfin represents leverage finance, which is like DCM, but with riskier entities. Um, DCM usually works with investment grade, while Levfin is going to work with those sub-investment grade, those high-yield companies, which are double B plus and lower. Um, also on your screen, you'll see the merchant bank. Um, some banks have this. It's essentially a private equity arm. It allows them to take actual principal positions. And uh, for example, a bank like Goldman Sachs has a specific merchant bank. Um, you'll also have middle office divisions, which are roles that you can also apply for, like say risk or operations. Um, you could also have things like HR, um, finance. Finance does not mean doing the financing for other companies. It relates to taxation and the accounting of the specific bank for which you are working. Um, so you do have these various roles within an investment bank. You'll also have something called technology, which is not the same as being a quant. Typically quants are in the markets division of an investment bank when they are front office quants. So they'll oftentimes sit on the trading floor and be very involved in this process. When you are talking about the tech role, that means a more back office position where you are building, creating and maintaining the support systems for the investment bank. Um, a lot of these traders have proprietary software that they use to um, trade better, trade more effectively, trade more efficiently. And those different um, software capacities are developed by the people in the technology division in a different office of the investment bank. That is very different than being a quant where you are writing the algorithms that will essentially trade these products like a trader would or hedge them better than a trader would, or at least as well as theoretically a trader would. 
All right, well, if that all makes sense, let's move on here and talk about common questions for investment banking. Let me grab a sip of water and let's begin. All right, to kick things off, investment banking interview questions. The key to answering many of these is knowing the three financial statements in and out. Firstly, the income statement begins with the revenue and flows down to net income. This illustrates the profitability of a company and covers a specified time like a quarter or a year. This is similar to the cash flow statement in the sense that it is over a period of time. However, it differs from the balance sheet that is a specific snapshot in time. This represents the company's resources, which are the assets, and the funding for the resources, which are the liabilities and shareholders' equity. The fundamental accounting equation must hold, which says that assets must equal the sum of liabilities and equity. The cash flow statement is the third financial statement and reconciles the cash balance over the period. This begins with net income, adjusts that for non-cash income to, and expenses to get to the operating cash flow. You also have cash flows from investing and financing, which are then added to operating cash flows to get the net cash balance for the time period. So we've got three things to look at here and they are all incredibly important. However, one common question that you'll see is if you could only have one financial statement, which one would you have and why? So with that in mind, let's think about this for a second. The cash flow statement is pretty important because it tells you how much cash is actually happening. There's this fundamental idea in accounting of the accrual basis system where you'll have accounting things happen that don't necessarily represent the actual exchange of funds. For example, you can have things like deferred revenue. You can have things like um, anything where you have accounts payable or accounts receivable. You are not getting cash at the same time as the actual business transaction is occurring. Because of this delayed divergence here, um, if you could only have one financial statement, it would be best to just have the cash flow statement because cash is king. The income statement and balance sheet, you could then make the cash flow statement. So another common question is if you could only have two um, financial statements, which two would you have? And that is the income statement and balance sheet. All right, um, investment banking interview questions part two. So again, just to run through the three financial statements, you can see them there on the left. We have the revenue at the top of the income statement, subtracting out COGS and getting to gross profit, subtract out the rest of your expenses and you can get to your earnings before tax. Um, take out your taxes and get to your net earnings, which will then flow to the top of your cash flow statement representing um, your uh, the start of your operating cash flow calculation by adding back things like DNA and subtracting out things like your changes in networking capital, you can get to your cash flow from operations. Add that to your cash from investing, which are like uh, investments in PPE, and also add that with your financing cash flow, which is either your issuance or repayment of debt or equity, you can get to your net increase or decrease in the cash on hand. Um, if you take that and add it to your opening cash balance, you can get to your net cash at the end of the period. This then flows up back into the balance sheet where you see cash as an asset. This along with things like accounts receivable and inventory and property, plant and equipment, um, some to get to your assets, and then on the liabilities and shareholders equity side of the equation, you'll have things like accounts payable or any sort of debt or any sort of notes getting to your liabilities. And then for your equity, you have your equity capital and retained earnings. Something to note here is that the balance sheet must always balance because of this equation, which means that your total assets must equal the sum of your total liabilities and shareholders equity. All right, moving on. How would you track $10 of depreciation through the three financial statements? Firstly, you have the income statement, 
depreciation is going to be an expense, which means that operating income, EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes will decline by $10, assuming a tax rate of 40%, which is unrealistic given the situation right now, with Trump having the tax rates around 21% and President-elect Biden likely to raise them to 28%, assuming Congress approves his agenda there. Regardless of that, if you assume a tax rate of 40%, net income will decline by $6, despite the $10 drop in operating income. On the balance sheet, cumulative depreciation will increase $10, so net PP&E will decrease by $10. Your retained earnings will decrease by $6 because of the reduction in net income, and assets are going to decrease by $6, which is the difference between negative 10 on your PP&E, your property, plant, and equipment, and cash rising by $4. Equity is thus going to decrease by $6. And as both sides of the accounting equation are down by $6, this remains balanced. On the cash flow statement, we see that net income decreased by $6 and the depreciation increased by 10. So the cash flow from operations increased by four. If you consider this math, it all makes sense. And this is a very common interview question. So be prepared um, for this in investment banking interviews. All right, another super common one. Walk me through a discounted cash flow analysis. So there are three main steps here. Firstly, you need to calculate the free cash flow for a forecast horizon of seven to 10 years, depending on the type of company and the maturity it is at already, um, you'd wanna use a varying length of time. Uh, then you're going to determine a terminal value for cash flows after they stabilize after the forecast uh, period. You're going to then discount these cash flows at an appropriate risk adjusted weight, which is going to be the weighted average cost of capital you can derive from the CAPM model, the capital asset pricing model. So two things to clarify here. Firstly, what is free cash flow? You're going to want to use the FCF that is unlevered or to the firm. However, if you were to lever it, you would do that by removing the tax adjusted interest and net debt repayments. However, for the unlevered calculations, let's look at this in detail. You take your net income and then add it to your interest expense times your, uh, times your debt tax shield. This tax shield is one minus the tax rate and represents the tax benefit by financing with debt. In addition, you're gonna add back your non-cash expenses, which are things like depreciation and amortization, subtract out your CapEx and subtract out your change in networking capital. With regard to terminal value, there are two ways to go about it. The first is more common in academic settings and the latter is going to be more common in practice. So with perpetuity methodologies, you see that you have a going concern assumption and you take the last number of free cash flow and assume that it is going to continue into perpetuity. This means by uh, take your last free cash flow number and multiply it by one plus the growth rate divided by the risk free rate minus the growth rate. And so with this formula in mind, a uh, question arises, what is the growth rate? So the growth rate needs to be close to the GDP of the country or the inflation rate or something low, but still probably positive because you want the company to continue growing, but it can't continue growing at a pace that's going to outpace the economy because then it will become the economy, which is an entirely unrealistic assumption. So with that in mind, growth rates are typically near 2%. Your risk-free rate number is probably going to be the 10-year treasury. Um, you can use more complex versions of this calculation and depending on the duration that you want to use, but it's typically some US treasury number. With this in mind, note that the US treasury is really low right now. So taking just the current 10-year treasury might give you an unrealistic valuation. For example, as of today, the 10-year treasury is trading at 92 basis points, which is 20 basis points higher than it was last Wednesday. However, it's still incredibly low. It might make more sense to take a five-year average of 10-year treasury rates if you're interested in using that for your risk-free rate. 
Um, with regard to the multiples method, think of things like taking your EBITDA and multiplying it by your EV divided by EBITDA. Your EV divided by EBITDA is a multiple that you would get from your comps. Um, it is important to pick a comp set that represents what you think the company is going to look like in um, whatever your forecast horizons terminal time is. Don't pick something that looks like the company today if you think the company is going to become something else down the, down the line. You wanna have a realistic assumption for what it's going to look like in five to 10 years. Obviously those two words are basically contradictory because having an obvious assumption for something that's happening far into the future is very unrealistic. However, that is the idea here. And that is the conversation that a DCF revolves around. So um, more specific questions. If you go into an interview and say that you're interested in M&A, they might come back at you and say, what are current market trends in M&A? You say you're interested in M&A. What do you know about M&A? So with that in mind, let's talk about some current market trends in M&A. Deal activity was up about 8% month over month in September with 1,022 announcements compared to 946 in August. Aggregate M&A spending was a whopping 48% higher, sorry, 47% higher rather. And if you look at the league tables, you can see that there are banks that are consistently leading the charge. These are dominant players in the field and great spots to look if you are very interested in going into the field. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, B of A are all at the top of the league tables by both deal count and deal size. When you look through the lens of deal count, which represents the number of deals announced, Hulahan Loki is above city. However, for deal size, that is inverted. Reality is they're all great shops and do have very strong M&A practices. You also have banks like Centerview or Mollus that are also strong in M&A, however, are not typically at the top of the league tables because of their size. Another bank to put in that category would be Catalyst with a Q out in Northern California. Uh, speaking of Northern California, two sectors that we've seen secular increases in M&A activity in are tech services and communications. Year over year this quarter, tech services saw an increase of about 100 deals and communications were up six uh, with their respective sizes. This was relatively substantial. And these were the only two sectors to show deal flow increases on fact set. Commercial services, consumer services, and finance declined the most. However, 19 of the 21 sectors posted relative losses in deal flow. So we do see deal flow weakening across the board in those specific sectors. However, we do have pent up demand in M&A because um, of how capital markets basically seized up back in uh, March and April of this year. We saw companies uh, raise funds to get cash on balance sheets and draw down, their, draw down their revolvers to make sure that they do have protection. However, um, they did not necessarily feel comfortable going through deal activity, which completely makes sense, but it is a reason that we've been seeing uh, huge numbers recently. All right, with that in mind, talking about the huge numbers that we've seen recently, let's look at some of them in a bit more detail. Let's talk about some recent deals. Um, another question you might get is, walk me through your favorite deal. You say you're interested in being a deal maker. Tell me about a deal that you've seen and um, what were the terms? What was it like? So with that in mind, um, let's kick it from the top with NVIDIA agreeing to acquire ARM from SoftBank for about $39 billion. This deal was announced last week. Um, there's a bit of a tricky situation with regard to if this will actually go through because of a payout from someone um, who runs ARM China. And he's asking for about $100 million to leave. So that part is in question. However, um, this deal was agreed upon and announced, so we'll likely go through. Gilead Sciences agreed to acquire Immunometric for 21, sorry, 20.4 billion US dollars rather. 
Um, so this is big movements in the healthcare space. We also had Illumina agreeing to acquire the remaining 85.5% of Grail for 8 billion US dollars. Walmart and Oracle will be acquiring the American operations of TikTok from ByteDance for 12 billion US dollars and Gore's holding for, which is a private equity um, fund agreed to acquire United Shore Financial Services from SFS Holding Corporation for about 15 billion US dollars. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see M&A at a glance and the US middle market monitor. Middle market basically just means deal size below $1 billion. And um, so as mentioned, there's this concept of multiples which show relative valuations between firms. Price to um, the price to equity is um, a different type of multiple because it does take into account the capital structure of the firm, which means that companies that have more or less debt can have different PE ratios than um, their peers just because of the amount of financial leverage that they have. However, metrics like EV to EBITDA, because they're based in enterprise rather than equity value, um, are immune to changes in capital structure in that regard, which means they're not really sensitive to changes in financial leverage. The median premium paid for deals is in the 30s this quarter, which is about typical. The reason that this premium does exist is that um, Basically, you're giving up the rights to sovereignty and sovereignty comes at a premium. Companies like the ability to be able to control their own operations. So for these operations to be taken over, this has to come at a premium. And these deals can be done in either cash equity or um, cash uh, equity being stock or debt for these transactions and are oftentimes done in a combination of all three of those forms. We see medium price to equity multiples being pretty constant right now. Um, this is about typical. However, if valuations do continue to skyrocket, we could see that number increase. One thing to note and reiterate upon is money is so cheap right now. Rates are so low across the board, seeing that we are in a global easing cycle. It's just so cheap to fund yourself. It's so cheap to raise debt, to go out and buy a company. There's no reason not to. All right. Um, what is debt restructuring? So this is the other side of product groups within an investment bank where you can be advising companies on essentially fixing their capital structure. This is, this is advisory for distressed companies that need to change their structure to either get out of or avoid bankruptcy proceedings. And when we reference bankruptcy here, there are two main types that we wanna talk about. Firstly, you have chapter seven, which is a fire sale liquidation. And you also have chapter 11, which is a reorganization process. There are two sides to a restructuring deal. You've got the debtor on one side, um, which typically prefers to go by the name company because nobody really likes the term being in debt. That's not necessarily a positive term with a, a good connotation. Um, on the other side of the table, you also have creditors. These are the people that have extended credit to the company. These are the people that have given the loans. These are either, say, private credit funds, actual lending banks, um, or bondholders that have given money to these companies that are now in distress and don't know if they're going to be able to pay it back. The reason that Chapter 11 exists is it allows um, the company to continue its operations while it restructures its capital structure, which basically essentially is going to optimize valuations for the creditors, which is what they want. Resolution steps or refis with either fresh debt or equity. Um, you could do some sort of sale or divestiture. Sometimes you'll see terms like a section 363 credit bid where you'll have all of the assets sold substantially to someone else. You can also have um, restructurings or bankruptcy filings, which give it protection um, and go through a court process. The problem with this is it can be long. 
Um, it can take years. You can have prepack filings where things happen before going into court and avoid the court process altogether. This is um, ideal for a lot of people. However, it is particularly bad for people in the equity seat because they do not get as much say in this process. Uh, one pertinent example recently is Whitling Petroleum, where you had like an equity exchange into the new equity at a rate of one to 75 shares. So that's far from ideal and definitely um, not great for the equity holders, whether that would have been better if you would have gone through a chapter 11 um, process, I don't know, but that definitely um, could have been a question in mind. All right, so with the world of distressed debt in mind, let's talk about some recent news. We see the high yield spread over treasuries tightening to 460 basis points. This is historically really tight. Um, you could, I mean, back in March, you saw the high yield spread trading around 750. So this is so much tighter than it was before. Um, when spreads are tight, it means that they are narrow. It means that it is close to the price of treasuries, which represent the risk-free rate of borrowing and lending under the full faith and credit um, of the US government. So with distressed debt in mind, let's talk about some recent stories. Um, I have videos that go into this in more detail. However, with Cedro Partners, we've seen the likely equitization of about $2.6 billion in debt. Pacific Drilling and CBL Associates in Pennsylvania REIT, which is the largest um, mall owner in Philadelphia. We've seen Chapter 11 filings. Callan Petroleum has had its distressed debt exchange and High Ridge Brands has made its liquidation effective. GNC has emerged from um, Harbin's 363 credit bid as well. So um, if you see trends here, we have consumer companies, we have lots of REITs struggling right now, particularly those with mall or commercial real estate exposure, and also oil and gas companies. The reason for oil and gas companies or energy more broadly is that we've seen such a, a fall in oil prices right now. We have WTI, at least today, is trading up 41 a barrel. Um, we have Brent at 43 today. However, just a couple of days ago, we had it in the mid 30s. So these still price these prices are still so low right now, um, and these companies depend on getting a high price of oil so that they are able to uh, sell their product at a profit. All right. With that in mind, I'm going to grab a drink of water and we can go into sales and trading and explore the common questions there. All right, outstanding. Sales and trading interview questions. Number one, you have $10 million, how should you invest it? When you get this question, the first way to attack it is by asking the investor what their goals are. Does the investor want big investor gains? Do they want tax-free retirement income? What type of assets are they predisposed to be interested in? When you're asked this in an interview, ask the interviewer a question back. Ask them a clarifying question and figure out how to tell your response. Are they old? Are they young? What type of products do they want? How much do they need this money? And with that in mind, um, look to an appropriate answer. Talk about, well, if they want high capital gains, then maybe they want a well-diversified equity portfolio, maybe something that's possibly levered or tilted towards tech or growth. They want something that's tax-free. Maybe they should look towards muni bonds. Maybe there's a specific part of the curve that they want to sit on. So with that in mind, um, make sure to tailor the response to investor goals. Another big one, pitch me a stock. Well, here are five steps on how to attack this question. Firstly, name the company and summarize its business. Then give a brief overview of the financials to both indicate the size and profitability. Show how it's undervalued compared to its peers and indicate its competitive advantages. State a long-term trend that supports its growth. And then talk about how the future is good for the company quantitatively. Give some idea of upside potential. If you are involved in an investment club on campus, 
Use a pitch you've already done for that. Use something that you've heard in your investment club. Use some idea that you already have background on before. Don't think of something on the spot. Have something ready to go and know what you're going to talk about. If you want to focus on a company that you've pitched before, this should be easy because you can talk about um, the DCF that you did. You can talk about how you use comparable companies to do some sort of extrinsic valuation of the company. You should have um, some predisposed thought going into a question like this. This is a very important question that will definitely come up if you do have investment experience on your resume. Um, people want to see how you can talk about that. If you do have specific experience, like for example, a background in options trading where you've been personally trading options in your own account or paper trading options in your own account. Maybe when you're told to pitch a stock, also add something about an options trade that's interest to you. Talk about how you would actually trade this in practice. And I think that's an amazing way to differentiate yourself. With that in mind, don't talk for longer than 90 seconds. Don't say something that's too common or too obscure. Use something that you've heard in your investment fund or you pitch for your investment fund that you don't necessarily um, use on a daily basis. Don't pitch Apple or like maybe Microsoft is fine, but don't pitch a super big name company because the person you're talking to is likely to already know a lot about it which means they can ask you even more questions about it. With that in mind, also do not forget the financials for the company. Um, just remember a couple key numbers, remember um, a couple key things going in and do not um, forget those. All right, big question here. Resulting trade ideas from res uh, recent news stories. So. Some things you might get are, tell me about a recent news story. So when you're attacking a question like this, state the main idea of the article, then explain supporting reasons and take an opinion. This is so important. You need to take an opinion. Anyone can look and say, okay, last Friday, there was a 6.9% unemployment rate. Use that to make a thesis about how that could be traded in practice because you're not applying for a job at Bloomberg, you're applying for a job in the sales and trading division of a major investment bank. You need to be able to trade these ideas. You need to be able to trade these news stories. You don't want to just repeat the news stories. So if someone asks thoughts on a recent news story, understand the news story and then take it one step further, either uh, come up with a trade idea in a different asset class outside of equities. This is especially pertinent if your bank does not trade equities. Deutsche Bank does not have an equities division. Don't go to Deutsche Bank and pitch them an equities trade if they ask you to pitch a trade idea. Pitch them an FX trade. Talk about where you think the cable rate is going to go. Talk about what you think is going to um change in a different asset class. Talk about a structured product. Talk about how you think the Fed is going to stop buying on the run treasuries to the maximum of their capacity in the market might have overpriced in your on the run coupons, the effect that you're gonna see on your, over, your on the run coupons. Talk about something where you are actually trading it. I cannot emphasis, emphasize that enough. With that in mind, um, to be able to be prepared for a question like this, you're gonna need some background with the financial markets right now, not just the theory, but the actual live events that are currently going on. With that in mind, use resources that are available to you. Use my YouTube channel, Lauren James Finance. Use my website, Finance News Flow. Use the Wall Street Journal. Nothing replaces the Wall Street Journal. Use Bloomberg, Financial Times. These are all free with Carnegie Mellon and irreplaceable. These are so important. All right, um, with that in mind, let's talk about the financial market. Context of COVID. Back in early February, we saw that the Dow, NASDAQ, and S&P 500 were at record highs. And I do say record at the time, as we have now far surpassed those highs. The MSCI World Index is at its highest um, right now. It's up about 7% on the year, which is kind of crazy seeing the immense volatility that we've seen during this period. However, 
Back to the story at hand, in late February, February 24th through 28th, we saw the largest one-week decline in the MSCI World Index since the Great Financial Crisis. It officially entered its correction period. However, uh, this record did not last long as um, we also saw more records being broken later in the coming weeks. On March 9th, we hit Black Monday, which was the worst one day drop since the great financial crisis at the time, which was then quickly beat by March 12th, which is known as Black Thursday in the worst one day fall in the US since 1987. In between these events on March 3rd, we saw an emergency Federal Reserve base uh, rate cut. This comes after the Fed had already done an emergency rate cut earlier in the year prior to its meeting. Um, this shows urgency by cutting rates to the zero to 25 lower bound right away. They're able to stimulate the economy. They do this through keeping the federal funds rate at that lower bound, but also working to keep um, uh, liquidity in financial markets by serving as the buyer of last resort. Um, not surprisingly, we, we all know what the impetus for this was. We saw COVID pandemic related shutdowns and big question marks on what was going to happen in the economy. The Russia and OPEC oil price war did not help the cause and um, did bring the prices of WTI down substantially. Results were markets down across the board, more than one third. However, again, do want to reiterate, we have seen a rebound all the way up uh, more than 7%. All right, uh, in the world of credit, we've seen impacts um, from COVID. We see a digital transformation affecting credit markets and a stalled move to a low carbon economy. Um, so this move is probably stalled. Um, don't think it's stopped. I'm probably even more accurate to say it's just paused for a little bit and is likely to come back. Um, the digital transformation has clearly helped stocks like Zoom and has strengthened credit names um, for similar companies that also do play in the tech space. We've seen uh, Netflix raise debt at record low rates as well as many other companies in comparable spaces. All right, um, one more thing, regardless of if you are applying for a job in investment banking or sales and trading, there are um, questions that you should be prepared to ask the interviewer. Conceptually, this seems a little weird, but this is very common in interviews that say it's half an hour for the interview. You get to speak for, you get to be answering the questions for the former 25 minutes. How, however, for the last five, you will be actually asking the interviewer questions, banking, um, banking questions to ask would include things like, what secular shifts are you watching right now? Something good that I like to do was that when you are asking a question, put something that you know in the question as well to show that you're not just going in cold, but rather have some background knowledge that you want to bring to the table to guide the upcoming discussion. You could say, what was an interesting transaction that you've worked on and what was your role? And possibly make this question even better by mentioning a transaction that you've seen in that sector. So say today Adobe announced that it's going to be doing its transaction. Um, so say, and you're talking to someone that works with um, tech companies, say what's an interesting transaction that you've seen knowing that Adobe is doing their transaction. And by using a reference to something that you know, you're strengthening your question and really directing them towards a specific area and impressing them along the way. For banking as well, maybe say something general, like being in my shoes a few years ago, what initially attracted you to this bank and what has kept you here? What has made you want to stay? For investment banking in particular, it's common to spend two years in investment banking as an analyst or three, depending on the bank. And then as soon as you get to the level where you could qualify for an associate promotion at the investment bank, jump to the buy side and move into the world of private equity. 
Um, so if someone's a bit older and had been there as an associate direct promote, maybe ask them why they wanted to stay. Um, but these are probably last resort questions. I would stick to the former two first and then hopefully have more specific questions to ask about their background um, and the little that they tell you in that conversation that you have prior in the markets division. Ask things like, what do you think about this big macro story? What do you think about Brexit? Do you think the cable is going to go above 131? Don't say, do you think the cable rate is going to go up? Say, do you think it's going to go above 131, which is where it's trading at right now, cable being the exchange rate between the pound and dollar. Um, so if you can put some context in it, again, just like with the banking questions, I think it goes a long way. Um, for markets as well, maybe talk about something relevant, like how is the Fed's continued low rate policy, or maybe even better, central banks around the world choosing to continue low rates? How has that affected your specific product? Listen to them at the beginning of the interview because they will likely tell you exactly what they do. They trade whatever the short end of the rates curve. Great, you can ask about treasury bills. You can ask about how the Fed's lending programs have affected the demand for money at the short end of the curve. Bring it back to what they do, show that you're an attentive list attentive listener and show that you've been paying attention to not just what has been said during the interview, but also things more broadly in the markets. All right, let's do a quick product overview and then I will let you guys go. Thank you so much for being here and going through this content today. I'm trying to make this as helpful and as tailored as possible. These are all the resources that I wish I had when I was going through the process and I by no means know everything, but definitely like to learn and help out as applicable. All right, let's talk about vanilla options. So what is an option? An option is a contractual agreement between two parties. This can be on any sort of thing. This can be on a stock. This can be on um, an FX rate. This could be on a derivative contract. This can be on pretty much anything. So the idea is you have a call, which is a long position, which is bullish. Your payoff is going to be the difference between the stock price at maturity and the strike price, the positive part. And then all of that is going to be less the premium paid for the option. This gives you the right, but not the obligation to buy a stock at a predetermined price at a predetermined time. A put is essentially the opposite. It gives you the right but not obligation to sell a stock at a predetermined price at a predetermined time. With this in mind, the payoff is going to be the opposite. Um, I hesitate at using the word the opposite, but it'll be with S and K switched here in this positive part equation. This means that your strike price uh, less the stock price is going to give you the value and then you only use that if it is positive you subtract out the premium paid which is 200 in both of these examples to essentially move this payoff structure down so this is what it looks like to buy um, a call and buy a put you can also sell calls and sell puts and there is this whole idea of greek risk exposure not necessarily having to do with Greece, the country, but um, you'll have your deltas, your gammas, your vegas, your thetas, and um, did I miss one? I think that's in rows exposure, but that one's a lot less important. I do have a video that goes through this in a lot more detail. And if you have any questions, we can definitely continue the conversation individually. Um, for the foreign exchange markets, this is $6.6 .6 trillion exchange daily. This is huge. This is the world's largest market. This is very important in the lifeblood of a bank like Deutsche Bank. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see market quotations of FX prices today. There are two big trends to watch in the FX markets. Honestly, there are a lot of trends to watch. I don't really touch these, and it's never been... Um, anything under my purview. So I do not have as much experience here. However, um, from my American point of view, the trend of a weakening US dollar is likely to continue. 
increased stimulus will weaken the dollar and markets are increasingly net short with a Biden presidency upcoming and possibility of having a full blue wave into the Senate. The House is already um, pretty much set on being blue as well. The idea of a carry trade is selling a dollar and longing emerging market currencies. So we've seen this done with a lot of Latin American currencies where you are selling dollars because dollars are cheap and it's cheap to finance yourself in dollars because rates here are so low and then buying things that have higher yields in emerging markets, whether this is on the corporate credit side or just on sovereign bonds out there, you're able to garner different exposure at a cheaper rate by doing something called the carry trade. You also have like the yen carry trade, which has been historically popular and a way a lot of hedge funds made money previously. Also with Brexit, we've mentioned the cable rate a couple of times today. It's currently at $1.31, um, which is around where it was at the start of the year. It crashed down to one fifteen in March amid COVID. However, it is likely to rise on a deal with Brexit. Boris Johnson is still going back and forth without the House of Lords approval and is still trying to get a deal through. Um, there are a whole host of different deadlines. Um, it's too much for me to keep up with. But there are a lot of things to watch if you are interested in that area. All right. Almost there. Let's talk about fixed income more broadly. On the far left of your screen, let's talk about rates markets. There are three different parts of rates markets. Credit, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, of rates markets, you have cash, derivatives, and exotics. Cash represents things like sovereign bonds, which are how companies fund themselves. So this is like a US Treasury or Govi or JGB, Japanese government bond. This is like directly the bond, that's the cash market. You also have derivatives, which are things like interest rate swaps and futures contracts written on top of bonds. So you'll have in the US Treasury futures on US Treasuries. You also have exotics, which are structured products based on rates, swaptions, and esoterics. And we can get into those in later videos. Uh, basically, that's the really mathematically fancy complex stuff. In the middle of the screen, we have credit. Uh, this represents corporate bonds and can either be investment grade or high yield and can also include things that are distressed, which means that they are downgraded where their prices fall drastically. Um, sometimes you'll have things like interest coverage ratios or leverage ratios as different covenants for the bonds. However, given that we are in a cov light environment right now, we are light on the number of covenants we have and we are light on the strength and enforcement of these covenants. With this in mind, We'll have like your EBITDA divided by interest expense and debt to EBITDA ratio. Um, just be things that companies look at or rather investors look at on companies um, to evaluate whether they want to still buy the credit, but not necessarily have it as a way to prevent companies from doing certain things um, like you'd have in environments that do have more debt uh, covenants. In the world of credit, we also have derivative products like credit default swaps, and we go into those in a lot more detail on our video on swaps. On the far right hand side of the screen, we see municipal bonds and public debt. Um, these are things issued by local governments that can be up to triple tax exempt. This is where terms like geos um, come into play and ultra high net worth investors like the short end of the curve, which means lower rates because of the tax benefits. Insurance companies and retail investors prefer the longer end because rates are higher. And this is going to be quoted on an MSNR curve. Um, so lots to look at here. This is a big world and um, a great spot to be in across the street. So as mentioned for corporates and sovereigns, there are credit ratings. So you'll have companies like S&P, Moody's and Fitch rate these securities. Um, so 
The reason that this matters is, firstly, it's an indication of risk of these bonds, but more importantly, arguably, there are a lot of investors that have specific mandates tailored to being either investment grade or high yield. So in the world of investment grade, these securities must be triple B minus or higher. So this is this like 10 mark right here. Where you see lower medium grade, anything from this light blue and above is considered to be investment grade. Below this, you have fallen angel risk, which is the jump between this 10 and 11 going from triple B minus to double B plus. This is non-investment grade. Your investor universe for investment uh, for investment grade funds, IG funds, is so much larger than for your non-investment grade funds. Because of that, as a uh, bond falls from being triple B minus to double B plus, its price will decrease drastically, more so than it would as if it was just moving from say double A to double A. Uh, to single A plus. Um, so this is something to watch. This is really interesting. And the Federal Reserve through this, uh, this quantitative easing program has been buying corporate bonds. And these corporate bonds um, are not just in the investment grade arena. They also do include fallen angels for the first time, which means companies that were investment grade prior to the COVID crisis, but were quickly downgraded because of probably um, some issue with COVID and the effect on either their top line or bottom line or ability to adhere to ideal interest coverage ratios or leverage ratios. All right, we also have credit, credit derivatives. Um, we have a whole nother video that goes into this, but the idea is there's a huge market for CDS, which are credit default swaps, essentially a way to synthetically take positions in the bond without having to directly own the bond. You can be long or short this contract, and it is pretty interesting. Highly recommend watching that video and asking me if you have any questions. All right, with that in mind, let's bring it back together. This is the investment bank. These are the two main front office divisions. We covered interview questions for today, giving an introduction to both investment banking advisory roles and sales and trading market making roles. This is what an investment bank looks like. And there are a whole host of opportunities within these divisions. So go into your interviews, be very prepared, stay up to date with markets for sales and trading, and know your accounting for investment banking, and you will be all set. All right, with that in mind, stay up to date with markets, um, be in touch, let me know if you need anything. Feel free to check out more videos on our YouTube channel at Lauren James Finance. I uh, use the website financenewsflow.com to stay up to date with market news. And um, yeah, I look forward to being touched, making more videos. If you have any recommendations, anything you want to hear, please don't hesitate to let me know at the email down here and I will be as responsive as possible. So with that in mind, have a great rest of your Sunday evening and I wish you all the best with the interview process.